Hello, everybody. Let me just get one thing set. Okay, so uh, I'm Paul Curtis, as Sonia said. So uh, two quick things about Weaveworks up front. Um, Weaveworks is a company. We're based in London. We've done a lot of work in Kubernetes. Heck, we've been running Kubernetes in production for more than five years. Most of the tooling that we've developed and put into the open source community uh, comes from our experiences of running a very large software as a service on Kubernetes uh, called Weave Cloud. Um, our CEO was very involved in the original technical oversight committee for the CNCF. The very beginning, we're very active in contributing to Kubernetes as well. So we have a lot of engineers from the open source who work with us. So tools like Flux and Flagger and EKS Control all came from Weave engineers and those guys are still working for us. Uh, but as a company, we actually generate um, a lot of revenue by doing services. So we do consulting, education, uh, de design, discovery. Uh, we have long-term and short-term engagements. Um, our customer base is very big and tends to be very large customers as well. And also small customers who are just starting out in the Kubernetes world. So those new to Kubernetes and EKS, uh, contact us to help them with design and discovery with their applications. The last thing we'll, we'll talk about a little bit later on in the presentation is Weave has taken all of our tooling and packaged it with a full 100% SLA technical support into the Weave Kubernetes platform. So as a part of that, there's operational support, there's design support, and the Weave Kubernetes platform, unlike most of the others, is agnostic to what components you use. So you can choose your service mesh or your storage platform or your CNI. And we will support those both in EC2 uh, as standard Kubernetes clusters or in EKS as well. Okay. Uh, I basically have covered all of this uh, in the last slide, but understand that Everybody looks at Kubernetes. Uh, different companies are in different places in the journey to per full production Kubernetes. So we can cover pretty much all of it and we can help you in pretty much every area that you'd wanna talk to. So now on to the presentation. Okay. We're gonna talk about GitOps and what the methodology means and how you use it. But I'm going to preface that a little bit by saying it's like companies choose to move their application stacks to Kubernetes for any number of reasons. And a lot of them have to do with uh, costs. Some of them are with numbers of teams, development cycles, tools that they're using today that they weren't using, let's say, five years ago. Um, and one of the key things that we hear a lot is security and compliance and auditability. Uh, you know, it's easier to do a lot of that in Kubernetes than it is in other platforms. So the GitOps methodology that we're gonna talk about um, allows you to take any one of these goals that you have for your Kubernetes deployment and actually make it better. And the GitOps methodology is relatively simple. So let's go right there and let's talk about what it is. So the core idea of this is, is that you have a source code repository in our world, typically Git, that contains the authoritative source for what you want running in your cluster. Now, that can be anything in the Kubernetes world. That could be service meshes, that could be RBOC, that could be any kind of Kubernetes object. If you think of it this way, uh, anything you can do with kube control can be done with the GitOps methodology. And so that includes things like custom resources, okay, things that are not um, intuitively obvious as being a Kubernetes object. And by putting it into Git, you gain a whole bunch of benefits, which we're gonna talk about. And then the second part of GitOps uh, which makes it a little bit different is, is that there's an automated process or an agent that takes that declared state, what you desire your cluster to look like, 
and then implements it in Kubernetes on your behalf. So this makes it simpler in the sense that you don't have to worry about actually executing the commands. There is an automated process that is doing this for you. So what are the basic principles? Now, we'll pretty much look at this. Number one, everything's declarative. The GitOps methodology assumes that we're using all declarative functionality. And Kubernetes, by its very nature and design, is declarative. And it's even more so now with uh, current versions of Kubernetes, not when I started, uh, things like custom resources and custom resource definitions allow us to make pretty much anything declarative. The second part, what you want your system to look like, that authoritative source, the canonical description or declaration of what your system is like is stored in Git. And obviously, when you put things in Git and you commit them and push them, it means that now you have versioned copies of everything. So looking at the genesis of how your cluster has evolved or the applications that are running in it have evolved becomes using the same tools you use for source code by going between different versions, right? Because it's Git. I can do Git diff. I can do Git log. I can do all these things. Which brings us to number three which is when you think about a source code repository and source code control, right? We already know how to use source code control. There's pretty much source code control everywhere. So how you do software releases with source code control can be applied to how you deploy those uh, software releases into your Kubernetes cluster. You can use the same processes, pull requests, merge reviews, okay? limiting who has the ability to do commits and pushes and merges. So all of a sudden, all the things that you use source code control for and software release for, you can apply to the declared state of how you want your Git cluster, to, uh, your Kubernetes cluster to be running. Now, if you look at those first three things, most people who've been in sysops or operations will look at me and say, that's infrastructure as code. I'm like, yeah, to a point. Okay, but to fix anything that's wrong in any of the first three steps or to make a change means that the operator has to take some imperative action. Okay, uh, I have to do Terraform plan or I have to run that Ansible playbook. Okay. It requires some kind of action. So the fourth step in the GitOps methodology, and there's a bit more to this, but this one's critical, is that we automate the process of actually deploying the Kubernetes objects to the cluster. And if it cannot do that, or if there is a drift, that agent alerts us. It lets us know that what you've declared I can't do in the cluster or what you've declared isn't there or what you've declared doesn't work. So this gives you the ability to say, hey, everything that's in Git, I can pretty much guarantee is running in that Kubernetes cluster unless it tells me otherwise, right? I don't need to run a status command. I don't need to do anything to know that that's true. Now we're gonna talk about it a little bit later what those give you as benefits, both technically and from a business perspective. So first we're gonna talk a little about CI and how you make this work. So continuous integration is a very well-known software development pattern. It's been around doing software releases for quite some time. There's a lot of tools, everybody knows how to use it. But fundamentally, it is an iterative process where you basically write code, you build it, you get it into Git, and you test it. And this goes around and around and around. Now, the exact order in which this happens may not be that way. In fact, my old shop, it was write the code, build, test, and then put it in Git. Either way. But this process is very nice for a developer because it means that they can rap, do rapid development, right? They can 
write code, push it in, test it, find problems, write code, push it in, test it. And they can do many, many iterative releases in a given day, okay? The other thing about this process is there's a lot of tools that are out there that support it, both commercial and open source. So it's a very well-established thing. So then when you get around to Kubernetes and you begin to see building containers becomes your end product, the natural inclination is to, hey, let's use our CI process to actually deploy those containers. Okay, so we add that to that cycle and now you have, you know, write code, build, get, deploy, test, you know, this, this cycle. There's a couple of major downfalls of doing this. The first one is most of the CI tools that are out there are not designed to monitor the deployment after it's been deployed. Now, if we take the original Jenkins and even Jenkins X, unless you do something very specific, it will certainly deploy whatever you tell it to deploy because it can run the kube control command, for example, or it can issue a curl API to the Kubernetes API. Yeah, no problem. What Jenkins doesn't do is monitor the cluster to make sure that that actually happened. So until you get to the test cycle, which may be after that deploy, you'll never know whether it actually worked. Now, there's been tools added to most of the CI tools out there that allow you to check to make sure it's running, but they're not really designed to do that. And for the most part, this is running outside the scope of the cluster. So typically the build system, either CI, might be running in containers, but it is not a part of the cluster that it's deploying. Right? So typically it's a separate thing. Right? It also tends to be maintained by the developers and the DevOps teams, whereas the clusters and the infrastructure are typically not managed by the DevOps teams, at least in big companies that we've seen. So this presents a couple of security things, which we'll talk about in a minute. But the idea is, is that you wanna separate the concerns. You wanna have CI be CI and not affect the developers and not make the developers have to learn how to deploy, right? And then you want the operations side of this where they're actually doing deployments and management of clusters and infrastructure. You don't want them to have to get involved in the development cycle. Why? Because the developers are good at writing code and testing their code and getting it running and doing lots of iterations. And the operations people are there to make sure the clusters are up and running, the services are provided, there's disaster recovery, there's high availability, security, you know, a myriad of things that the developers really know they have to understand, but it's not really their job. So we put this wall in the middle, but the connection between the two is Git, is a source code repository. So the GitOps methodology basically says you have CI and developers manage that, DevOps teams manage that, engineering managers manage that part of it. And then you have deployment. And deployment is this Kubernetes GitOps that we talked about a little bit before where the deployment is occurring automatically, okay? So what do you get out of that? Well, the first thing you get out of it is, is that the deployment is all done with source code tools. So Deploying to Kubernetes becomes using the same tool set that the developer already knows how to use. That being a source code repository and probably an editor, right? If he has to write a, a Helm chart or he has to make up a manifest or he has to build a customized template or something like that, right? That's what he needs to know. He doesn't need to know how that actually gets deployed. What he needs to know is what has to be in it, right? Because it's his application that is getting deployed. Right? The GitOps methodology on the deployment side says now you get another benefit and it's kind of an interesting one. It's, it's sort of odd, but it means that as everything is versioned, I can know exactly what got deployed by whom and when. So now all of a sudden the security guys get a big smile on their face because, hey, wait a minute, I've got a complete audit trail right, get log will give you a very pretty audit trail. 
And I'll show you kind of what that looks like, but think of it that way. And the last thing, which is not obvious to most people, but becomes a huge benefit, and especially in some of the uh, customer cases that we have, is that when it's deployed, right, both the developers and the operations people can see exactly what's running in the cluster. And because there's a software agent that's ensuring that that is occurring, meaning that everything you've declared is running, it becomes observable to both sides. So if there is a problem, you don't have this go back and forth on what version you're running, go get this, go get that. No, the developer goes to Git repo and says, that's the wrong image tag. You should be running this image tag and either makes the change and gets it deployed or tells the ops guy to make the change and get it deployed. Right, so it becomes observable. You can see everything that's happened. It's very transparent, right? And because they're verifiable and auditable, it means that now I have a complete trail for what happened. But it also gives you a side benefit that is, again, not intuitively obvious, right? So what happens if you have a, a source code release that has a problem? You either fix the bug or you roll it back. Well, if you're do, using Git, how do you roll back infrastructure in Kubernetes? Well, using GitOps, you basically move the commit ID of the head of whatever branch it's pointing to back one or two or three to the last known working version. And the software agent will undeploy what's running and redeploy what you know was working. So upgrading software, either to fix problems or to improve it or to roll back, becomes not a function of playing with the cluster, it becomes a function of changing what's declared in Git. You have no idea how powerful this is. And in Weaveworks' own example, our software as a service, that's what saves us. Is if we push something and it goes horribly wrong, especially when you have thousands of clusters, we can roll back to the last known version simply by moving the commit ID and everything else is taken care of. Now, from business perspective, the number one thing that makes GitOps very easy to implement in any shop is security, right? Now, how does this work? Well, if you used Jenkins to do deployment, that means that Jenkins has to have the cluster admin credentials for every cluster it can deploy to stored in Jenkins somewhere. It's gotta be there because it's gotta be able to do an API call or a kube control, right? Which means that the cluster admin credentials for potentially production clusters could be in a lot of different places. Or if you still do it manually, I have to have that kube config on my laptop in order to do a kube control. Okay, it's a big security problem because you're basically handing out root credentials to your cluster in order to get it to do something automated. Whereas in the GitOps method, the cluster credentials actually don't even have to be outside the cluster because the agent runs in the cluster. It's not external. It's, and I'll show it to you, it's a, it's a pod. And that pod runs Flux, and Flux monitors the Git repo, the image registries. And since it's inside the cluster, it has the cluster admin credentials, but no one else needs them. So we already cut off a huge security concern, just went away. The second one, in security, the term separation of concerns, you'll hear this a lot. It's like you don't want everybody to be able to do everything. Well. If I do it with Jenkins or a CI tool, if I do deployment that way, it means that an operational set of credentials, the cluster admin credentials now have to be given to the development team and vice versa. That becomes a really big problem because it's very hard to track them. It's very hard to know who did what, right? Because if I do kube control at the command line, Yes, I can go in and look at the event log for Kubernetes. It'll tell me when that happened and what, and basically, you know, what the event was, but it won't tell me who. Whereas in the Git world, because a person has to do a Git commit and a Git push, 
the commit ID is attached to a human being, typically, or to a automated process that is easily identifiable. Second thing about separation of concerns. Once you create a set of credentials and you hand them out to people to use in either automated processes or at the command line, it's really hard to revoke them. Whereas in the Git world, if Git is the mechanism that is used for deployment and that is the declared state of the cluster, only people who can write to that Git repo can make changes to the cluster. How do you, let's say I resign, you just remove my privileges, I can no longer change it. So there is a huge separation of concerns um, issue that gets mitigated very quickly by using GitOps. Second one, we already talked about, but it becomes very simple because it is transparent, everybody can see it, and it is audited because Git does that for you. By the way, I'm using Git as a generic term, not GitHub or GitLab or Bitbucket. All of these tools, Gitia, there's a bunch of them, that will work with this methodology. Right, so Git is just a source code repository for us. Which brings us to the next one. Who can make changes to the cluster is based on who has right ability to the Git repo, the directory, and the branch. That means that you can create teams and those teams can write to certain branches or certain directories in the Git repo, whereas other teams cannot and can control that portion of the deployment. So you can be very selective on who can make changes. Simply by using the same policies, users, teams, groups that you've already created for source code control, like, you know, registry and stuff, you just apply it to the deployment as well. And the last one is the one you take to your boss. The very simplest case for using GitOps risk reduction is two, well, there's actually two of them. The first one's very simple. If I have a cluster defined in Git and it's running in EKS and it's running in US East 1 and US East 1 goes south for whatever reason, it will take me exactly 12 minutes to bring up that exact same cluster without the persistent data in US East 2 because all I need to do is use EKS control and point it to that Git repo, the same Git repo. I'm done. Disaster recovery becomes very simple. But also from a risk standpoint, it means that I can roll back. And let's say I have five clusters that use that same Git repository for their configuration and they're spread out all over the world. I make one change to the commit ID in one repo and it will change all five clusters. So the risk reduction becomes very simple to enumerate. I can explain it. I can say, as long as you can't do touch this repo, you can't do anything. And oh, by the way, if I need to fix it, I can go back to version two simply by changing the manifest or moving the commit ID. It becomes a very simple thing to explain risk. So we've talked about a lot of things about GitOps. Please, if you have questions, there's a Q&A panel. Um, put them in there and we'll get to them at the end. Okay, so let's take a use case, an actual case study. So Metal, Metal is a division of NatWest Bank. So this is a highly regulated um, organization and they have a lot of rules and regulations that they have to pay, pay attention to. So I just want you to look at two numbers on this page. Okay, very, very critical. The first one is developer productivity. Because the developers didn't have to worry about the deployment part, they saved an enormous amount of time. So they took deployment out of the CI cycle and all of a sudden all the uh, CI process had to do was write a file and push it to a Git repo and then keep going. And then they could run their tests against the live dev system, you know, whatever tests that they were running because it would, it deploy, it would deploy those applications automatically and then they could just run the tests. So reduce the time that they waited to get anything deployed and up and running to fundamentally 
you know, drop 30% of that time away that they don't have to worry about. The second one is MTTR. And for those who don't know what MTTR is, it's mean time to recovery. Okay, 20 minutes. 12 minutes of that 20 were spinning up the EKS clusters. Right, that means that I can go from zero to a running full cluster system in 20 minutes. Take that to this, your um, CIO and explain it to them. And then all of a sudden this becomes a rational way to do this, okay? Now, what we do as a company is we package all this stuff together. So we put it into a form that allows you to do things. Uh, the Weave Kubernetes platform is, is basically a set of tools, but I wanna show you what GitOps looks like actually running. So I'm gonna switch over to uh, one of our Weave Kubernetes platform clusters, that one. And I'm, I assume that that can be seen. So when we approach a cluster, uh, Weaveworks, is we approach it from two different perspectives. First one is, from the operational side, there are going to be requirements um, that every cluster must meet. And typically those fall into things like network policy, uh, pod security policy, admission control, um, RBOC, authentication authorization, sometimes things like storage come into that play. So the way we look at it is the design pattern goes this way. You have one, GitOps methodology for the baseline cluster. So in EKS control, this is called a profile. And basically what the profile is, is a Git repo that contains all the Kubernetes components that you want EKS to run when it is started up. So when you use profiles with EKS control, okay, enable profile and that set of tools, you can point it and say, go, use this Git repo and all the manifests and Helm charts and, and things like that in there. And when you get the cluster up and running, go and install all this stuff, okay? This is typically, as I said, things like security, RBOC, network policy, PSP. Um, in our best practice, we do things like put in the monitoring tools here as well whether those be the open source things like Prometheus and Grafana, which you can see are in here, right? Or they would be a uh, hook into CloudWatch, or they may be to a third party vendor that you already have in place. So you fire up their containers to do that. But that's the cluster level, right? And then you have to look at the application level. So the one of the two major design patterns is to use namespaces to do that. And so the good thing about the software agent Flux is Flux does not have to run for the whole cluster. You can actually run more than one of them. So what we do here is we say this base level cluster profile is defined in the, oh boy, I got to sign in. Um, this Git repo, Sorry about that. You may ask me, yes it does. One second. So in the Git repo, what it allows you to say is that this is where the underlying, um, underlying baseline profile is. So for us in this particular case, here they are. So this is what gets installed when the cluster first boots up. So it initializes Kubernetes and everything in this particular directory gets done. So all of these, there's a mix in here. You can see there's some manifests, there's some Helm charts, the Grafana dashboards that get installed. Um, there's also some JK config in here as well. It doesn't really matter what's in here. This could be anything. This could be a mix of manifests and charts, for example. But then when you get to the application level, you say, we're going to use namespaces to do that. So we'll take, for example, a team like this, and we'll create a workspace. And what the workspace does is it creates the namespace, creates the namespaces RBAC, and then goes ahead 
and attaches it to a separate Git repo or a separate branch of a Git repo. So if I go and click here and look at it, you'll see, oh, this one has this deployment in it. Here's what's deployed there. I can go in and look. Oh, when did we do that? Well, it was done 14 year, days ago on this Git commit. And oh, by the way, we moved it from one namespace to another. So with nothing more than read-only access to Git, I can probably debug 90% of the problems right off the bat because I can go in and see what was actually built out. So same thing here, right? Here's an Nginx deploy, right? Looks like it was done five days ago. And oh, by the way, it was initially done five days ago. And by the way, who did that? Oh, it's this guy up here. He did it on this date, right? So you begin to see how powerful this becomes when you use this over and over and over again. It, it makes it extraordinarily simple to build out whole infrastructures. Now, the agent that runs, which is, I apologize, which is called Flux, um, actually runs in its own namespace. So you, you can take a look at what's actually running in the cluster. And you'll see basically there's Flux and there's a Helm operator, okay, and a memcache date. But that's what is the software agent. It is in a container. It's actually done with a custom resource as well. And there can be more than one Flux running. So if we go down and look at one of our namespaces, um, let me just pick one. Oh, there's one. I think that has something in it. Yeah, you can see there's a flux in here as well, as long as well as my applications. So this namespace and this view of the world right here becomes, let's say, a project or an application or a team or development. This might be the development workspace versus the production workspace, right? They can deploy anything they want in here, but things like maybe ingress controllers, service meshes, RBOC for the whole cluster, that's probably going to be done at this level. So this is kind of the uh, walkthrough of what, we're, what we talk about when we look at GitOps. So the idea is you can structure how you deploy and how you develop in many different ways. And because you can replicate it and reproduce it so simply using Git, it becomes very, very simple uh, to redeploy these out. Okay, so I'm gonna jump back to here for a second. Okay. So just to give you an idea, Security with GitOps is all Git based. So however your source code repository is managed becomes the way that you control how things get deployed. Since typically you don't have to give out cluster admin credentials, i.e. the kube config, except when the cluster is initially installed. In fact, with EKS control, you don't even have to do it then. Right? It means that those who can write to that Git repo now can control what runs there. So you've eliminated a whole set of security issues. The other thing that you get here is, is that I can make consistent clusters over and over and over again. The repeatability becomes very simple. So if I need to spin up a staging cluster that is the exact match of my production cluster, I can do that in EKS very simply, simply by creating another cluster and pointing it to the production profile. Now, the only thing that Kubernetes does not, and this is Kubernetes that doesn't deal with this, does not deal with is persistent data. And that's something that you guys, typically there's plans to do that, whether they be using shared uh, resources, file systems, and or aggregated um, storage resources. There's a lot of ways to approach that. And for every one I could give you, someone will come up with two other different ones. But basically, that's how you want to look at this, okay? So at this point, I'm going to hit for questions. 